I'm really happy to be here today to talk about a topic I'm really passionate about, which is blockchain privacy. Maybe to be more precise, today, the next 20 minutes, I'm planning to talk about stealth addresses, and even more precise, it will be about ERC-5564, which is also called stealth addresses. Um, maybe let me quickly introduce myself to those um, that don't know me yet. My name is Tony Warstetter. I work at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, doing mostly privacy stuff there, um, mostly focusing on Bitcoin and Ethereum privacy. Maybe some of you might know me from other projects like MathBoost.pix, Tornado Warning, which are more or less hobbyish projects. But today's talk is actually very different. Today I want to talk about um, EIP-5564 stealth addresses. Maybe to give you a quick rough outline what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the first part, I want to define the problem. In the second part, we are going to cover some techni technical details about stealth addresses. And then we are moving on with um, use cases for stealth addresses and going deeper into the weeds with EAP 5564 and why some standardization is needed to finally get some adoption for stealth addresses. So let's directly dive into the problem definition. As you can see here on the slides, we have two entities, which is Alice and Bob. And Alice has some money that she wants to transfer to Bob. So far, so simple. The problem here is there is a large crowd looking at them because the blockchain is, of course, publicly accessible and transparent. And Alice, she cares a lot about privacy, and she wants to avoid that people can create a link between those. So Alice doesn't want to create a link to Bob, and this might have a lot of different reasons. For example, Bob might be a politically exposed party, or Bob might be a seller of some illicit goods. There are many reasons why people just want not to create a link between two entities. So what Alice could actually do is she could just reach out to Bob and ask Bob to generate a fresh address for this interaction. Bob could be like, yeah, let's do that. And then Bob generates a fresh address, which is here address C. And Alice could then use the fresh generated address to just send the money there. So far, so good. The only problem is it needs some interaction beforehand. So at some point, Bob would probably be like, OK, wouldn't it be cool to do the same, but without requiring any prior interaction? And this is exactly the point where both of them might discover stealth addresses. So stealth addresses kind of allow Alice to generate a fresh Ethereum account, a fresh Ethereum address that has never been used um, in the name of Bob. Alice would then just send the money to the new stealth address, knowing that only Bob will be able to access the funds there. For everyone else, it would look like Alice just sent funds to a new address. And this could be um, even Alice herself. So maybe Alice just switched her wallets and has transferred the money to a new account. And I've, um, I, may, I remember Vitalik has um, mentioned that um, shortly. You just don't want to create a link between those entities. And what Alice and Bob have achieved in this example is unlinkability. So what they don't achieve was untraceability, but they get unlinkability. So they get the property of not creating a link between the sender and the recipient. Um, unlinkability is defined by, for any two outgoing transactions, we cannot tell that they went to the same entity. And this is exactly the case here, because we cannot tell that address B and address C are actually both controlled by Bob. So how does it work? Essentially, it's quite simple when you compare it, for example, to more sophisticated stuff we already hear, like CK snarks or homomorphic encryption, because we only need elliptic curve math here. So we have both entities again. We have Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob both possess a key pair. And the lowercase letter here is donated as the private key, and the uppercase letter is the public key. So um, es essentially, Bob has his own key pair, and Alice can just create a random key pair. So this is important. Alice is not using her own key pair. Alice is actually using a randomly generated key pair to generate the stealth address. So the first step, Alice, what Alice has to do is Alice derives the, private, uh, the public key of Bob. So the public key is public, so this is um, no challenge for her. Alice gets the public key of Bob, 
and then she does the following. Alice multiplies her own um, private key, so this is an elliptic curve multiplication, she uh, multiplies her own private key, just to recall, it's a randomly generated private key, she multiplies it to the public key of Bob. She hashes the result, which gives her a hash chat secret, kind of, and then she multiplies the hash chat secret with the um, generator point of the elliptic curve, which then gives her a public key, so an elliptic curve coordinate, that she can then use to add Bob's public key to it. Finally, this would then be called a stealth um, public key, and Alice can just um, convert that stealth public key to an Ethereum address and would be able to send to that Ethereum address. So this is described in the third step. Alice would send to the Ethereum address and would also publish her ephemeral public key. And here, just to recall, the ephemeral public key was created from some random integer. So it's not actually Alice private key, it's some random integer where Alice derived the public key from. Now, the funds are now on the stealth address, and now we need some way for Bob to find out that he received the money. So what Bob does is he takes all the ephemeral public keys that have ever been published on chain, and he loops over them. So he takes all of them, and then she, he just tries out if one of these ephemeral public keys um, can be used to derive an address that has some funds on it, and if there are some funds on it, then Bob can be sure that that's actually a stealth address that he controls. So what Bob does, he loops over all the ephemeral public keys, he multiplies his own private key to it, he does ex essentially the same that Alice does, but with his own public key and his own private key. So you can see um, Bob, in the end, he also has this value HS, which is the hash shared secret between both. Bob multiplies it with the generator point to get an elliptic curve coordinate, and then he can just add his own public key to it, and, and that's essentially it. So what Bob can then do, he can also derive the private key to that address, and that's the kind of the magic stuff that is here involved, because Bob has his own private key, and he can use the private key and add it to the hashed shared secret, which is here denoted as HS. And by doing so, Bob can derive a new, public, a new private key that is then able to access the funds on the stealth address. And for those interested why the whole thing works, it's essentially this equation holds true, which says, okay, we have the hash shared secret and we can multiply it with the generator point of the elliptic curve and then add the public key of the recipient, which is the same, then first doing a simple arithmetic addition between the private key of the recipient, in this case of Bob, plus the hash shared secret, and then multiplying the whole thing with the generator point. So this is essentially the background, how the whole thing works, and yeah, we can, maybe one more thing, um, Stealth addresses have been continuously improved over time. So the first iteration, so the first proposal for stealth addresses is from 2011. Um, it was improved in 2013 in the CryptoNode white paper. And what the CryptoNode white paper essentially did was equipping the recipient with two public keys. So the recipient here has two public keys. One is a spending public key and the other is a scanning public key. M many of you might know that from Monero or something other privacy-focused protocols. So what we can do here is we can separate the parsing process from accessing the stealth address. So this means we can now give the scanning private key, which is here denoted as small, uh, lowercase sc, we can give that away to a trusted third party, which could be um, some Telegram bot or something else that can then notify the recipient as soon as a stealth address transaction appeared. So Bob would not be um, forced to do the parsing, which is some heavy computational work himself. He could just give away his scanning parsing, um, his scanning private key, and then he can get notifications every time when he received some stealth address transactions. Right, then let's, let me quickly come to the, to the question, why do we even need some standardization and why ERC-5564 even exists? The problem about stealth addresses is that stealth addresses are not 
directly equal to stealth addresses. What I mean by that is there are many, many different protocols we can use today to generate stealth addresses. So I just showed you a very simple protocol that used um, the SEC, for example, the SEC 256K1 curve that is also used on Ethereum. But we can actually use many different approaches to generate these stealth addresses. For example, just to give you a sense, academia has came up with many, many different proposals of how we can generate stealth addresses and how we can continuously improve them. So on this slide, you can see um, stealth addresses being um, computed with um, post-quantum secure lattice based cryptography. But there are also um, stealth addresses um, that use elliptic curve pairings, for example. But the, the essence here is standardization is key. So we need some way to tell the recipient how we calculated the stealth address, because otherwise the recipient would have no possibility to find out which protocol was used to generate the stealth address. And this is exactly where ERC or ERP5564 comes in, because ERP5564 um, proposes this standardized framework where we can transmit the information that is required by the recipient to know which exact stealth address protocol was used um, to the recipient so that the recipient can directly um, continue parsing in the right way. For those knowing um, some parts of Solidity, you can directly tell how simple the contract is. So the contract essentially only has an event, which is the announcement that finally includes the information that is required by the recipient to first um, find the stealth address and second derive the private key to the stealth address and second there is a function um, that can do nothing else but emitting um, the event. And what the event includes is, is a schema ID, a stealth address himself, the ephemeral public key and some metadata. So the schema ID is the part used to indicate which stealth address protocol that was used. For example, we could have the SEC256K1 curve having the Shima ID1. And then we could have some elliptic curve pairing based um, stealth address protocol having the Shima ID2. And by looking at the Shima ID, the recipient directly knows, okay, if I want to check if that stealth address transactions went to myself, I will just have to um, see what the schema is and then continue in the, um, using the right stealth address protocol. Secondly, there is the stealth address itself that is included in the event and this is just some UX improvement to not require any RPC calls for positive balances because as soon as the recipient has derived the stealth address, he must, he must only compare if the stealth address locked in the event matches the stealth address he computed or she computed and if so, then he can be sure that the stealth address belonged to, to that entity. Third, the ephemeral public key, which is the important information for the recipient to, um, to find its own um, stealth address and also to calculate the um, private key that can finally access the stealth address. And, and lastly, there's the metadata field that can be used to indicate which token contract um, was interacted with. So you can also send ERC20 tokens, ERC721 tokens by just specifying the token contract address in the metadata. And there are, there's additional place um, in the metadata. You can also um, put the method ID into the metadata field and also the amount of tokens that was interacted with. So EIP5564 also comes with its own um, address format. The address format is nothing else than a prefix and two public keys. Just to recall, that's the two public keys, so the parsing public key and the scanning public key are also re often referred to as the viewing um, public key, and they are encoded in one address format. So the address format is quite long, as you can see, because it essentially holds two public keys. They are both compressed, so we have the prefix and two public keys, the spending public key and the viewing public key, and together um, they create this new address format where users will just need to get the stealth meta address, so this is called the stealth meta address, of the recipient, input it into some user interface, and then the user interface is able to generate a stealth address on the fly, and directly um, sent to that stealth address. So the user will only need the stealth meta address of the recipient, and importantly, 
um, there's no way to create a connection between the stealth meta address and the stealth addresses created from that stealth meta address. So the stealth meta address can be published, for example, on some website in the Twitter bio, and it can also be published as another EIP um, in some central place, so having a smart contract that just stores the stealth meta address, which can be used to signal the ability to receive stealth address, but also having some central place that one could use to store his own, her own stealth meta address um, for others to find it quickly. What to use them for? So Vitalik already mentioned it um, briefly. Stealth addresses are very handy to be used for donations because donations have this property where you often want, don't want a link between the, the donor and the recipient. So for example, if you're in a politically exposed party and you want to be able to receive donations but you know that people might not want to donate to you because of this public link that is created, then staff addresses are perfectly fine because they can, in this case, protect the sender of donating because the sender can then be sure that um, there's no link between the politically exposed party and herself. Furthermore, payroll checks. So you could just give the stealth meta address to your employee, and your employee will then be able to generate stealth addresses on behalf of you that you can then access so you would receive your payroll checks to a new stealth address every time. Third, multi-signatures. So also Vitalik mentioned that very briefly, so that if you don't want to um, let your multi-signature signers know who the other signers are. You could just grant them access rights to a, um, signing rights to a stealth address. This would then mean that the individual um, signers, they would not be able to find out who the other signers are because you would not grant um, signing rights, for example, to Alice.Eve and Bob.Eve, but to stealth addresses of them. And finally, there are some other use cases like private POAPs and stuff, but more or less it's every interaction that should remain private. So every interaction where you don't want to create a link between the sender and the recipient. That's essentially all, so thank you very much. I want to point out there is a proof of concept, so if you, have, if you, bring, have, if you bring your laptop with you, just um, you can go to stealth-wallet.xyz, stealth so there is a proof of concept deployed on Sepolia, so you can use it already today. Um, it might not work on, on mobile, but it will work on desktop, so um, try it out, it should, it should be working. And also a big shout out to the guys from Umbra. Umbra, um, you can find them at app.umbra.cash. It's an application already deployed since 2020, implementing stealth addresses in a little different way than EAP, um, than EAP 5564 does, but it's essentially already live on mainnet and you can use them already today. And also you can find my contacts here if you have any questions or if, you are, if you're building a wallet that um, cares about privacy, then feel free to reach out. I'm really happy to answer any questions. Thank you.